Now we are four months into this very strange and difficult world of COVID-19. So how are you doing? Are you feeling scared or anxious? Are you feeling tired or discouraged? Or are you feeling brave and hopeful? It is important to understand that being brave doesn't mean that we have nothing to fear. Being brave means doing the right thing at the right time, even if you are feeling afraid. How do you think Joseph felt when he was thrown into a pit by his brothers? Subsequently, he was sold to the Ishmaelite traders, again by the same brothers. How was his faith? Was he scared? I'm sure he was. Did he d still do the right thing even when he was afraid? I know he did. Then just when he was secure with a great job and responsibility in Potiphar's house, he was lied about and thrown into prison. I, I'm sure he was, <clears throat> or do you think he was once again scared and discouraged? Absolutely. I'm sure he was, but he didn't wallow in self-pity. No, instead he picked himself up and soon was the leader in the prison. Even though he was not qu quickly, quickly released, it seemed he had more lessons to learn. Are you feeling discouraged? Do you sometimes feel like you are in a COVID prison wearing masks? Well, let's see how God helped Joseph, as I think it will be an encouragement to us and our present situation. Hopefully one day we can all say, as Joseph said, you meant it for my destruction, but God meant it for good. We are beginning a series on Joseph, and today is an overview of Joseph's life. As we continue through this series, we will get in more depth on his story. I can't wait to get started. How about you? I want to just give you a little outline of the sermon today. There are four P's in Joseph's life. Pivotal, providential, prosperous, and pure. And Joseph had three tests that he passed. Self-pity, sexual enticement, and self-indulgence. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God, we want to invite your Holy Spirit to come and your presence to be with us today. Give me the words to say that will glorify you and use this story of Joseph to bring about truths that are in your Holy Scriptures. In thy holy name, amen. In every period of history, there are leaders and statesmen who stand out and are long remembered for various reasons. In the modern American era, who stands out as one of those? Anybody have an idea? Not everybody agrees. FDR. That's a good one. I would say President John F. Kennedy. Historians have long speculated on how America might have been different had he survived his first term and gone on to win a second term. Instead, he was assassinated in the third year of his presidency. John Kennedy was the youngest man ever to be elected president. Besides displaying the energy and appeal of a young man, he was handsome, wealthy, and had a beautiful wife. With such idealism, he was viewed by many so that his short term in Washington was called Camelot. He was the most popular president of the modern era. A ruler in the Old Testament seems to have enjoyed the same popularity and charisma as Kennedy, Joseph, the son of Jacob. Born into prominence in Canaan, he was sold into slavery in Egypt as a youth, 17 years old, but then rose to become the second most powerful man in the land. 
The story of Joseph is one of the greatest in the Bibles. In the Bible, his story has ambition, temptation, a poverty to palace theme, brilliance, wisdom, kindness, and high drama. He was certainly a leader who stood out in his day and has been remembered ever since. Genesis is a book of big bibliographies, the stories of its characters. Following Adam, there are seven great men whose lives are recorded in Genesis. Abel brought an excellent sacrifice to God, and Enoch walked with God and was taken up to heaven. Noah built an ark in obedience to God and preserved the human race. Next was Abraham, the friend of God, who defined what it meant to walk by faith. <clears throat> Next was Abraham's son, Isaac, who illustrated the submission of faith. Isaac's son, Jacob, was next. He was an up-and-down man who showed what it was like to be in the school of faith. And finally, there was Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob. It is his story that fills the final chapters of Genesis, taking us right into Exodus. Joseph's story is told from chapter 37 to chapter 50, except chapters 38 and 49, which touch on other subjects. More of Genesis than is given to any of the other main characters is given to Joseph. That fact alone is evidence of its importance in terms of Old Testament history. But in our study of Joseph, we will be covering chapters 38 and 49 to be thorough. As we study Joseph's life, we will discover many worthwhile reasons to study him. He was a man whose faith was pivotal to his life and success. Joseph's life was pivotal. Joseph served as a connector between the books of Genesis and Exodus, a hinge on which the story of the descendants of Abraham turns. If you don't know about Joseph, it is impossible to understand how Abraham's descendants go from being a family of shepherds in Canaan to a nation of over two million people when they returned back to Canaan. After Joseph was sold into slavery as a teenager by his brothers, a famine came upon the land of Canaan in Egypt. By then, Joseph was elevated to a position of prominence in Egypt and was wise enough to have the nation store up grain for seven years of famine. When his brothers came to Egypt looking, to buy, looking for food to buy, they discovered the brother they had sold into slavery years before. After a tearful reunion, Joseph brought his father Jacob and all his family, 70 total, found in Genesis 46-7. They counted them all. To, he brought them to Egypt to escape the famine of Canaan. Pharaoh gave Joseph permission to settle his family in Goshen where they lived for 430 years, increasing in number to two million people. Genesis 47, 27 says, So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Had Joseph not been sent ahead to Egypt, there would have been no rescue for the descendants of Abraham. In Exodus 1, we find a new pharaoh arising in Egypt who did not know Joseph. He feared that the rapidly multiplying Hebrews might gain to too much power. So while they were manageable, he subject, subjected all of Jacob's descendants to slavery. But the Bible says the more the Egyptians afflicted the Hebrews, the more they multiplied and grew. And the Egyptians were in dread of the children of Israel. No matter how they were afflicted, the Hebrew slaves continued to multiply, 
consistent with the promise of God to Abraham. Joseph is the indispensable link between the 70 who entered Egypt and the 2 million that left. Joseph's life was providential. When Teddy Roosevelt was campaigning for president in 1912, he was shot in the chest while delivering a speech. The bullet was deflected by a folded 50-page speech and a metal glasses case that was, in, that was in the inside pocket of his coat. The bullet lodged in his chest but did no permanent damage. Roosevelt later admitted that he had often complained about having to carry that heavy metal case, glasses case around, but he did admit that it had saved his life. What happened to Teddy Roosevelt was providential, and what happened to Joseph was providential as well, as Joseph would ultimately confess. God took dark events in Joseph's life and used them to put him in a place where he could be saved, he could save the de descendants of Abraham from extinction during the famine in Canaan. Joseph's life is a perfect illustration of how God causes all things to work for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 In Genesis 45, we find Joseph's brothers meeting him for the first time since selling him into slavery. They were terrified, thinking Joseph would exact revenge on them for their former evil deed. For he tells them, them not to fear that God had sent him to Egypt by their hands to prepare a way of deliverance for them. Joseph saw and tried to convince his brothers that God was at work in what they did. They didn't make their actions right, that didn't make their actions right, but God used their actions for good. When their father Jacob died, the brothers again thought Joseph would seek revenge. But Joseph told them that what they had meant for evil, God meant it for good, in order to save their family. Joseph had saw the big picture of what God had done. He saw that God's purposes were bigger than any man's plans. He saw that God could take a bad thing and turn it into a good thing. Joseph's story is the story of the providence of God. Joseph's life was also prosperous. Have you noticed Joseph was a winner? It was his success that saved Abraham's descendants from starvation. That was, is obvious. But he was successful even when it looked like he was losing. Joseph's success can be followed by studying five dreams. Two about himself when he was a teenager in Canaan, two from a butler and a baker while in prison in Egypt, and one dream from the Pharaoh that Joseph interpreted for him. Who would you compare Joseph to at that point with all these dreams? Daniel, absolutely. Daniel spent his life doing interpreting dreams. Joseph's two dreams about himself are found in Genesis 37, 5 to 11. Both these dreams predict Joseph's rise to prominence over his brothers and his family. And he might have been considered arrogant for relaying the dreams to his brothers, but he was just telling them what he saw. He believed the dreams were a message of God. To him. He certainly didn't anticipate his brothers acting so violently to the obvious message that Joseph was communicating, his coming place of rule over his family. But they did. One day they were in the, fi one day they were in the field working when they saw Joseph approaching, and their sibling jealousy got the better of them. So they faked Joseph's accidental death for their father and sold him to traders heading for Egypt. Years later, when the brothers entered Egypt looking for food, they found that Joseph's dreams had come true. 
He was the second most prosperous man in Egypt and held their very lives in his hand. Joseph's brothers, and ultimately Jacob himself, bowed down to before Joseph, just as his dreams had predicted. It was Joseph's predicted prosperity that saved his family's life. Everything Joseph touched in Egypt turned to gold, figuratively speaking. He was a successful man. Genesis 39.2 says, The Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Genesis 39.3 says, The blessing of the Lord was on all that, the, all that Potiphar had in his house and in the field. Genesis 39.5 says, Even when Joseph was falsely accused and thrown into prison, he prospered. He was put in charge of all the prisoners, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. It's important to note that Joseph didn't make himself prosper. It was the Lord who prospered him. Joseph was a winner and a success story worthy of study. Joseph's life was pure. It, was, it is interesting how God often had sent us the same message in life more than once before we get his point. As a dog that returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. It's Proverbs 26, 11. Even we who seek the, to follow the Lord don't always respond to God's reproofs the first time. Joseph was no fool. He learned his lessons the first time. Every time. Whenever God put Joseph in a potentially dangerous situation, he always took God's sign. That meant he was promoted to the next level of tests. There were three primary challenges in Joseph's life, all which he passed with flying colors. The test of self-pity. Joseph had been persecuted by his own brothers, thrown into a pit, sold to slave traders, falsely accused, and thrown into prison, and betrayed by a man in prison whom he helped gain his freedom. Joseph had a lot of reasons to feel sorry for himself and to have his own pity party, but we do not find one word of self-pity or grumbling on the Joseph's part from the beginning to the end of his story. He seemed to have the ability to see God and, and the good in every situation in life. The test of sexual enticement. When Joseph was falsely accused and thrown into prison, it was because he resisted the sexual advances of his master's wife in Egypt. When Joseph re resisted her seduction, she accused her husband of, of him attacking her. It was his word against hers. In fact, she, had, she also had his coat that she pulled off him as he fled, and her word won the day. He, de he declared two reasons for resisting her temptation. He refused to dishonor his master, who had shown kindness to him, and he refused to dishonor God. Genesis 39, 9. So Joseph passed the test of sexual temptation with flying colors and kept himself pure in the sight of God and man. The test of self-indulgence. Joseph's biggest test was when he was made ruler over all Egypt. Secondary, second only to Pharaoh in power and authority. The test was whether Joseph would use his power to enrich himself or to use it to serve the people of Egypt. Predictably, for him, he used it to serve the people. It was by his foresight and wisdom that he organized the nation to save enough grain in the good years to get them through the famine in the lean years. Passing the test of prosperity and power is most often harder than passing the test of adversity. 
but Joseph passed successfully. I have mentioned how the Bible records nothing negative about the life of Joseph. He is one of three Old Testament, major Old Testament characters about whom that is true. You know who the other two were? Daniel and Jonathan. Yeah. A study of the life of Joseph will pay rich dividends for those who will take the time to study the Bible concerning him. And I want to give the Lord praise that we also have patriarchs and prophets. We should, we should ask ourselves, is my life a pivotal life? All of our choices impact other people. And the question is, how? Are we looking for the evidence of God's providence in our lives? If you sit back and look at your life, you will find God's providence in your life. Do we trust before we jump to conclusions? Are you asking God to make your life spiritually prosperous? Are you dreaming big dreams for God's kingdom? Too many of us are content with leaving a small footprint in the sand of life when we should be leaving a larger one. You don't need to be a ruler over a nation to change the world, but you do need to have a world-changing dream. What about purity? Joseph remained faithful to God in a pagan culture, and we can too. And we do that by living faithfully for Christ, who is the ultimate example of faithfulness in this world. As we study together Joseph's life, may we be inspired by his life to change our world for Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for the life of Joseph and the ability to study his life. We ask for wisdom as we continue to study this man's character and his life that we can gain benefits for our own lives today and help us look to you as our ultimate person of example and character. In thy holy name, amen.